Hello ladies and gents, today we're going to be talking about the three things that the narcissist fears the most. The first thing that they fear the most is exposure. Narcissists are, by their very definition, extremely concerned with their image, how other people perceive them. They're heavily invested. You could say that they consider that their survival, their sense of being, their sense of survival and existing in the world depends on their false self-image that they've invested so much in projecting outward. Having that self-image, that false image, exposed as being false is terrifying to them. What should you do with that information? That means that if you can catch them in bare-faced lies, if you can record them when they're showing their true side and, and keep that recording, if you can capture emails where they show you their true side, they will be afraid of you exposing them provided it is contradictory to their fake self-image. Now, if their self-image is that they're a bullying, sadistic, psychopath, and they're a narcissist as well, who is mean to people, and you say, I'm going to expose to the world how mean you are to me, they'll laugh at you because they're not afraid of that. They fear exposure. That's not exposure. So if they present the, the world as this, but you can show people that they're actually this way, that's exposure. If they're presenting to the world that they're a mean bullying dick and you have evidence that they're a mean bullying dick, that's not leverage. That's nothing. That's, that actually, in, in fact, if anything, that feeds into the self-image. So that's not going to work as leverage. The second thing that the narcissist fears is any sort of defiance. Defiance represents a loss of control. So when you become authentically defiant, not if the target acts defiant, gets themselves all revved up and says no for a minute only to fall back into um, old patterns of behavior. But when you show defiance where you say no and you feel the no and you mean the no and you have the full intention of living that no, then they become fearful. Why? This feeds into their third major fear, which is a loss. Loss. Narcissists massively fear loss, particularly loss of supply. So if you deny them and you say no, that triggers the fear that you'll move to the next level and completely detach from them. There is no way you would say no and mean no if the false image was still held over you and you were still committed to making that relationship work. So false image is everything. False image is all. If you want like um, a sort of a battle plan, remember false image is everything them maintaining their vain idea of who they are in the eyes of you and in the eyes of the community is hugely important to them. The second phase that explains all of their behavior is down to narcissistic supply. So in, in number two thing that they fear is defiance because defiance, if it's real, will eventually lead to detaching from them and leaving. You can only say no if you intend to detach and you can only detach and leave them if the false image holds no sway over you anymore. This they are terrified of. If they fail to convince you of their God-like status, of their specialness, their uniqueness, their amazingness, that they're the best thing that's ever happened to you, that you'll never do better than them, that you're, you, know, you can't live without them. If they fail to convince you of that, they become deeply anxious. In fact, they go into abandonment terror. Why? Because this whole thing, this whole structure that they've created is about securing, not love, but attention. Because in childhood, they never received love. So they attached to attention instead of love. And they didn't attach to a parent who would then go on to become an intimate partner. They attached to an audience member. So they can really only do a dynamic where somebody is applauding them. So, for example, in your defiance phase, you may stop applauding them. You may stop doing your job. You'll notice when you stop doing your job, when you start taking your toys home, when you take your attention and your emotion back and you're like, I'm no longer going to serve you in this weird dyad that we're in, then you'll see real fear. I know that I saw that in my last relationship. The only time I saw real fear was when I stopped bluffing and trying to fix the relationship and I actually went to the place where I was like emotionally ready to leave. And it wasn't a tactic. 
I just stopped trying to appease her and then I saw real fear because she knew that she'd lost control of me and she knew that the next step was only moments away, whether it would take three days or three weeks or indeed if I'd lasted another three months, one day I would leave, it wouldn't matter because she didn't have that magical hold over me. You can, if you want to, think of it like uh, black magic, like um, love spells. You know, you have a love spell if you're doing black magic. If, you, if you're a witch or a wizard and you put black magic on somebody and you bound them to you with a love spell and then you saw that spell breaking and you could see the, the, the target like waking up from the, the magical slumber they've been put in and dusting themselves off and going, hang on a second, what the hell am I doing this for? I don't have to do this you would become fearful. So they fear exposure. They fear damage to the narcissistic self-image. They fear defiance. And then they fear loss of supply, loss of supply. Now I said a word there and I didn't explain it, which is a dyad. So if you're in a relationship with somebody and it's a narcissistically abusive relationship, this is not, um, it's very popular to use the, 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 the phrase today, victim blaming. Oh, you're victim blaming, you're victim blaming. On this channel, I tell the truth, no matter how painful it is, no matter how hard it is for the targets of narcissistic abuse, the codependents, as we say, of narcissistic abuse, because I want you to heal, I want you to get better, and then I want you to leave. I want you to unsubscribe not just from me, but from all of the YouTube gurus of narcissistic abuse. And I want you to love again and get on with your life. You have some bitter medicine to swallow, my friends, and you will swallow it. Or you can go elsewhere and have your little bottom patted. It wasn't your fault. You did nothing, but it's not true. It's not true. Now, what's a dyad? If you're in a dyad, that means you are in a folly à deux. It's almost like a kind of group psychosis. Folly à deux would mean um, madness for two in French, folie à deux. So your madness is actually sort of the, uh, you know, we have this mythology of vampires. And in some vampire myths, I know in the Anne Rice uh, cycle of novels that, that I used to read when I, when I was younger, you would, the, the vampire would drink from you, but you would also drink the vampire's blood as well. So it was this perverted symbiosis. If you were to become, there was a special role for a vampire's victim. I can't remember what it was called, but if, if he or she wanted to keep you alive and keep you as a pet and keep you as a familiar, there are different vampire laws and mythologies, but this always exists. There are, there are targets that vampires kill. They drink them and then they cast them aside and it's a corpse, it's finished. And then there are targets that vampires keep and they make their targets vampires. They infect the target with vampirism. They infect us with their narcissism. So it becomes a folly à deux. They infect you with their insanity, with their mental in health. It becomes your infection. You're trying to escape the relationship or you do escape the relationship. And, and as you're trying to escape it, you're like, why am I acting this way? Why am I talking this way? Why am I thinking and feeling this way? You're infected. And then after the relationship, you go, oh, they're out of my life. I'll be fine now. I don't feel fine. Something's wrong here. I don't feel very good at all. It's an infection. It's an infection and you must treat it. It won't get better on its own. There are people out there who are on forums who've been doing this for 10 years they, or longer. They never recovered. Don't be one of them. Don't let this person win. Your win is to stop watching these videos and to go and get on with your life. Take this as a golden opportunity now to heal. Most people, most human beings on this planet are traumatized in some way from childhood or from life. Take the time out to heal the trauma because the particular paralyzing, anesthetizing venom that this spider bit you with and infected you with, it actually has the, uh, the sideline effect of inflaming all previous traumas. It gets into you and all of a sudden any insecurities you ever had that it cascades down back into your past, into your childhood, attachment issues with your mother, attachment issues with your father, things that happen to you when you're a teenager. It's all inflamed because you're trapped in this weird, um, perverting, corrupting hall of mirrors. And you'll end up with the feeling that there is something wrong with you. That is you accepting, accepting, accepting the narcissist's worldview that there's something wrong with you. 
because they've been telling you, haven't they? For days, for weeks, for hours, for months that there's something wrong with you, that they want to help you, but you have issues. There's something wrong with you. This is your fault. Do you see what you're doing? You're doing it again, but they wouldn't lie to me. Why would they not lie to me? Because they love me. I know that they love me because then your brain stacks all the things that they did and said, I know that they love me. I feel their love and they're telling me there's something wrong with me. No, there's no way that somebody who loves you would lie to you about that, is there? It's very damaging. It's very damaging. It's very confusing. It's very unpleasant. I'm sorry that you're here. I really am. I'm sorry that this has happened to you. I'm sorry that you feel driven and obsessed to find solutions because you wake up in pain every day as though it happened to you yesterday. That's the nature of the infection. Don't treat the symptoms, treat the cause and get it all the way out of you. So the three things the narcissist fears the most are exposure that defy the false self defiance that tell them that you know that their false self is not real, that you're, that you're not enthralled by them anymore. And then ultimately the loss of narcissistic supply. That's you. You're just milkshake in this scenario. You're not even a person to them. I know it's hard to hear. It's a bitter draft I have mixed for you and I'm an evil man making you drink it, but you won't heal otherwise. They never loved you. They can't love you. They never love anyone. They don't love themselves. You are a thing to them. They can replace you. It's very quick and very easy because for various reasons, they're not, they never really attach to anybody, not as a human. They attach to you as a thing. And the only attachment they can do is the attachment with their fangs into your neck. Now they didn't bleed you dry and cast you aside like they do other people. They made you a familiar. They made you special. They made you a mini vampire that could hang around with them. And you felt special, didn't you? Yeah, me too. You felt special and that became addictive, didn't it? To feel special just like them. To receive narcissistic adulation in their side glow, basking in their, in their sort of stolen spotlight from the shadows, not quite center stage, but there acknowledged how privileged you felt, how privileged I felt to just get a little scrap, a little crumb of recognition. But that's what they do. They addict you to them. So it becomes effectively an addictive cycle. You're trapped inside of an addictive cycle. And that's why you're obsessively rocking, tapping, thrashing, trying to find a way out. My recommendation would be to deliver the ultimate blow to the narcissist, which is to fully heal. So there is a fourth and hidden thing that the narcissist fears the most that I put after the 12 minute mark. So only the patient and intelligent people would get it, which is they fear your healing more than anything else. They fear you picking yourself up, being whole and getting on with the rest of your life more than anything else, because it proves to them indisputably that they are not who they think they are. So heal, get on with your life, forget about all of this, put it all behind you. And you'll say to me, well, how? I have videos on this channel, which might not interest you. They are about codependency. And you might say, I'm not a codependent. I have videos about something called CPTSD. And you might say that sounds complicated and weird. I don't have PTSD. I'm not a soldier returning from a war. I'm not the victim of a violent assault. Whether you were a codependent before you met the narcissist or whether you did have CPTSD before you met the narcissist is irrelevant because now you are a codependent and you do have CPTSD. And that's why you're repetitively and obsessively and compulsively asking again and again and again, because your brain is locked into who was this person? What did it mean? Did they love me or not? So I'll say it again. The answer is very simple. No, they didn't. They didn't love you because I can't love my boots. They didn't love you because I can't love my jacket. It's just a thing. It keeps me warm when I need it. And then when I don't need it, I get another jacket. The weather changes, seasons change, fashions change. Jackets are replaceable. You're just a jacket, something to be worn, something to gather effect. You probably brought them narcissistic supply. You probably realized that you brought them narcissistic supply and you experienced 
through proximity, narcissistic elation, just like they did. And you knew it was you. And then they addicted you to that. You now know if you've been with a narcissist, you know what narcissistic elation is. I do. I do. The closest thing I can compare it to in my whole life previous to this experience was being addicted to cocaine. So I know what a cocaine high is. I know what narcissistic elation is. They, they must stimulate very similar areas of the brain in very, very similar ways. There is a high and then there is a low. And then you have to fight for your next hit. You have to wait for your next hit. You have to fawn and beg and scrape and perform to get your next hit of narcissistic supply from Nosferatu. I had to follow her around like the little wretched golem I was, little thirsty vampire, tugging at her skirts, hoping that her cruel gaze would befall me and I might get one more little drop. <laughs> oh, that's enough, slave, that's enough. Don't be greedy. You're not me. Don't rise too high. Keep crawling. So, not very nice, not very pleasant, but I want you to realize the truth. You were not loved. They did not love you. They cannot love. But you can move on with your life and you can be stronger from this experience than you were before it. I know that you can because I did and I know that you can because I have plenty of clients who did. You must understand what it means to be a codependent. Even if you don't want to study it, you've got to learn what it means to be a codependent. I have a video on that subject. I suggest you watch it. Uh, it's called Three Things Everybody Gets Wrong About Codependency and I'll link to it at the end of this video. You've got to understand CPTSD. If you're obsessed and you can't move on, guess what? You have CPTSD. It's going to take you much less time to just admit it, acknowledge it, live with it and do something about it than to try and avoid it. So in this sense, the more difficult, slower path really is the easiest and fastest path. Let me say that again. The more difficult, slower path is the easiest and fastest path. Learn what emotional flashbacks are. Learn what complex post-traumatic stress is. Learn what codependency is and start studying to heal these things in you. Because what do you want to do? You've learned four things here. Three things the narcissist fears the most. The first thing was exposure, anything that defies the false self. The second thing was defiance, hearing the word no and finding out that you don't hold them in the high esteem that you did before. The third thing is loss. These people suffer terribly from abandonment terror. The only way that they can know anything approximating love is by capturing a victim and sinking their fangs into them and cocooning them in a web in which they slowly die. If you break free of that and wiggle away, they're left all alone again. And you've shown them that they're not that special. And the fourth hidden thing that they fear the absolute most is that you go on with your life happy. Maybe with a few scars, but stronger and happier in ways that they cannot possibly imagine than you ever were before. I hope that you heal. I truly do. And I hope that you move on and that you don't need videos like this anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for your attention. And stay grateful for everything that you do already have. Cheers. Folks, if you enjoyed that, there are more episodes for you to watch right here. Please click on that. If you want to subscribe to me, do it here. And here is a PDF for you that is completely free. You get stuck inside of their narcissistic shell, their fake reality with them and without the air and the oxygen of feedback from other